Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuhu. That is, the peace of God be upon you and his mercy and his blessings and his paradise. I'd like to begin this khutbah here on July 8th, 2022, on the eve of what we call the Eid ul Adha. That is the celebration, the recurring happiness celebration of the greater Eid, the greater one meaning greater enlightenment in the sense that human beings are coming together for enlightenment and get to know each other. So it's a community victory as opposed to the individual victories that we experience after celebrating the fast of Ramadan. So again, it's Eid al Adha, Adha. And there's a chapter in the Quran called Adduha, that is the glorious morning light coming from ignorance into enlightenment. Praise be to Allah, the cherished and sustainer of all the worlds. I call the Adhan now. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Hayya ala salah. Hayya ala salah. Hayya ala al-falah. Hayya ala al-falah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. For those of you who may not know what I just said in Arabic, the Adhan calling the people to prayer, and it's done by what is called a Mu'adhan. So I'm taking the part of Mu'adhan as well as the uh, Khatib or lecturer for today. Many times the uh, Mu'adhan is the one that calls the Adhan, but I'm calling it today, and I pray a lot that you will uh, forgive me for going against the usual protocol. So we said Allahu Akbar four times, that is, God is greater, and if you really want to be more technical about it, we are saying that Allah is greater than anything that you may compare him with. So the phrase is Allahu Akbaru min kulli shay. That is, God is greater than anything that you would endeavor or attempt to compare with him. And then we said, I bear witness that there is no deity but the one deity, Allah alone. We call him Allah, but if you wanted to translate Allah, it's really saying the one and only deity, the only being existing, existing that has the property of being worthy of worship and total obedience to. And then, after saying that twice, we said, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. That is, I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger and servant of Allah, not part of the Godhead, not his son, but the servant of that one and only deity. We said that twice. And then we said, Life, Hayya ala salat. Life is upon the worship of God or the prayer to God. And we said that twice, and then we turned to the left, and we said, life is upon falah, hayal al-falah. That is cultivation. Cultivation of what? Cultivation of the intellect as well as cultivation of the physical earth. We need both. So Muslims are balanced in the sense that we recognize that we should have some cognizance of God and obedience to God, but at the same time, we should be workers and doers and discoverers of new things and acquiring knowledge by cultivating the intellect. And then we said again, 
Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. We said it twice and then we concluded the Adhan with La ilaha illallah. That is no deity but the one and only deity. So I'd like to begin this khutbah by reciting two verses that I really love to quote, and that is from the Surah 45, al jathiya And that is, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. Falillahi alhamdu, Rabbis Samawati wa Rabbil Ardi, Rabbil Alameen. Then praise be to Allah, Lord of the heavens and Lord of the earth, Lord and cherisher of all of the worlds, all of the knowledge bases. To him, that is to Allah, to him be glory and greatness. He has all of that throughout the heavens and the earth, and he is exalted in power, full of wisdom. So the title of this particular surah 45 is The Bowing of the Knee. So God sets forth in this particular chapter or surah all of the wonderful things that he does, and so he's telling us in the conclusion of this particular surah, then why don't you all bow your knees to me? I'm the greatest thing existing. If you want some greatness for yourself, then you have to latch on to obedience to the Creator and the words that he has set forth in this Quran and the beautiful human nature that he has given us. So I continue now by taking you to the Surah 2 in the Quran, or Chapter 2. We say Surah in Arabic, but it's chapter, if you want to translate that into English. So, God is telling us in the Surah 2, verse 127, and remember, Ibrahim and Ishmael raised the foundations of the house with this prayer. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiul alim. Our Lord, accept this service from us, for you are the all-hearing, the all-knowing. So Muslims believe and know, actually, if you have complete confidence in this book from God being from God, and it's no falsehood in it, and no falsehood can approach it, except in English translations and other translations, but as far as the Quran itself, the words of Allah can't touch that. So this is letting us know that God missioned Ibrahim and his son Ishmael to build the Kaaba, the Kaaba. And some will argue that they rebuilt it and it was there before and they just rebuilt it. But at any rate, we know in the Quran Allah is telling them to build this house and they built the house and they asked for God to accept them building the house. And then the next ayah says, Our Lord, make us of Muslims bowing to thy will. What are Muslims? A Muslim is one who is actively in a state of submitting to the will of God, and by so doing, he reaches a state, a semblance of, if you will, peace and safety. So that's what a Muslim is. So I told some students at a middle school one time, I showed them a picture of a camel. And if you see a close-up of a camel, if you've seen a camel, they don't look that great in the face, you know? In fact, their bodies look kind of, you know, not really great in, in terms of having those humps and whatnot. But we know those humps got water in them, and we also know that that hump is a nice little seat if you want to take a ride. <laughs> so I told them, I said, we believe that the camel is a Muslim. And they say, what? And they looked at me in, in astonishment. I said, let me tell you why. And I said, because the camel does exactly what the creator made him or her to do. When you need some water, they know where the water holes are in the desert. 
And if you don't have a camel that knows where the water holes are, you're going to have a problem in the desert because there's not too much water around there, right? The camel takes them from place to place. The camel's milk is consumed. When the camel gets old and, and can't function, they kill them and they take the fur and use the fur of the camel. And some of us have camel coats here in America and other parts of the world. So I told him, yes, he's a Muslim because he obeys what he, Allah, he obeys God, and he does what he was created to do. Then I went on to tell them the son is a Muslim too. You look out in the paper and it says that the sun is going to rise at 6.32 a.m. You go out, here it comes, it's coming up, it's coming up. So the word Muslim in its pure technical understanding means that entity that submits to the will of the creator. So Jesus was a Muslim, all the prophets of God were Muslims, and we are Muslims too, if we only but knew. I'm saying to the Christians and people who don't understand what Al-Islam is. So Muslim, again, is, it act, is an active participle, meaning a being or an entity that submits to the will of God. Even say the sunflower is a Muslim. Sunflower, when the sun comes up and it's coming from the east and it goes to the west, what does the sunflower do? It moves in the direction of the sun. So praise be to Allah, I hope that I clarified what the term Muslim means. And it happens to be in what we call the fourth form of the Arabic verb, meaning that there's some causation involved and there's some dynamism involved. You can get better, I can get better, we can get better as Muslims. So continuing the translation, or I should say the English, of this Ayah 128 or chapter, uh, I should say verse 128. O oh, our Lord, make us of Muslims bowing to thy will, and of our progeny, meaning the people that come after us, a people, Muslim, bowing to thy will, and show us our places for the celebration of due rights, and turn unto us, we know we're not going to be perfect, in mercy, for you are the off-returning most merciful. Innaka anta anta Again, in Naka and Tet Tawabur Rahim. So, continuing on, we know that there is a chapter 22 in the Quran that talks about the Hajj and some of the things that we are instructed to do in Hajj. So, I would encourage you to study the chapter 22 and know that. The purpose of the Hajj is for you and I to witness the oneness of the human family. You see Chinese, Africans, Yugoslavians, Saudi Arabians, people from all parts of the world coming together, bowing before the one and only deity, Allah. You can call him God if you like. In fact, the Quran says, Call me a Rahman, the merciful benefactor, or call me by any of my names. It is well. Praise be to Allah. Also, the Hajj is a journey for you and for me and for all of us to renew and repair ourselves from some of the impurities that we may have picked up in our lives or in previous years or for the future, we hope to have strength to be focused on trying to fight impurities, fight wrongdoing within ourselves and in the world. So there's a hadith, I don't like to quote a whole lot of hadith, but I think it's a very uh, significant hadith in terms of people being acquainted with it. And I'll just share a little bit about what I see it to be if it has any truth at all in terms of having metaphorical meaning and it says in paraphrase, the black stone, when it was in heaven, it was pure and white as milk. But when it descended down to the earth, the sins of humankind
tarnished or blackened it. They're suggesting that this was a stone that was white. And if you take it from a physical point of view, sometimes fire can make something and it looks white hot. And then when it cools off, it's black. But that's not the message in the story or in the hadith or the report that they have out there. I believe, O oh Muslims, that God is talking about the black stone being a symbol of the heavenly, pure, undefiled existence of you and of me and all of us when we were in the wombs of our mothers. We were pure and undefiled, but when we came down out of the heavenly existence in the womb, the societal factors and our desire to do this and do that, that's not in the court of God would have us to do, it tarnished and blackened our nature. And that is why we have the Quran. That is why we have scripture, so that we can make a concerted effort to go back to the original nature that we had coming out of the wombs of our mothers. That's one of the purposes of the Hajj. And the black stone that we're talking about is a stone that's actually on, I believe, the northeast corner of the Kaaba. And sometimes people risk their lives pushing through the crowd, trying to touch the black stone. I have a son that went to, to Hajj, uh, Garrett Ahmed. And uh, he said that uh, he got up early in the morning and a whole lot of people weren't around. He walked right up there and touched it, no problem. But some people would try to get there and they wound up unfortunately getting trampled to death. So it is a symbol. And we know that the history says that if you can't get to it, just blow a kiss at it. So when you blow the kiss, what are you doing? You are saying, I affirm the original nature of the human being is something that I love. I love my original nature that pulls me to right as opposed to pulling me to wrongdoing and disregard for the Creator. So there are many symbols in the Hajj, and you and I have a duty to try to understand them for what they really mean. And inshallah, you will endeavor to do that. So the black stone is a symbol of the human heart, the original nature that all of us have coming out of the wounds of our mothers. And God says uh, that he has created the human beings in the most excellent of modes. And he also reveals to us and we have made noble and honorable all of the sons of Adam. So if you are an African American, if you are a Chinese American or Chinese uh, native or whatever Ethnicity, ethnicity, pardon me, you have, you are a being that was made noble by the Creator Himself, and there's no room for you or for me or any of us to have any inferiority complex. And we know it's been hard for the African American to uh, see himself as equal to the Caucasians that uh, rule America. But know that Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is bringing out the African Americans with great substance. He promised it in Genesis 15, 13, if there's any truth to that particular uh, verse, where it says, Know of a surety, Ibrahim, that thy seed will be in a land that is not theirs, and they will be enslaved for 400 years. But I will judge that nation and bring you all out with great substance. We, the African Americans, are the seed of Ibrahim, of Abraham and Hagar, the Egyptian. And you know, many of us forget that Egypt is in Africa. Praise be to Allah. So we come from that lineage. We have the blood of Abraham, Hagar, Ishmael the prophet in our being in our ancestral line. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
he too had African blood in him. So you who are not Muslims, who don't like the what you call the Arabs or, or the camel jockeys at the stores and whatnot, if you don't like them because of their bad character and the way they treat you, I can understand that. But embrace the Arabic language. Embrace the Quran. Embrace Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who, again, is your brother. And he is indeed an African Arab. Praise be to Allah, the cherisher and sustainer of all of the worlds. So also in this chapter 2, Verse 124, and I read it now in English. And remember, God is telling us, and remember that Ibrahim was tried by his Lord with certain commands which he fulfilled. He said, Inni ja'aluka linnasi imaman. I will make you, speaking of Ibrahim, an imam. This is the only time in the Quran where the term imam is used close to being a title, a title, imam. So Prophet Muhammad, he was our prophet. Abu Bakr, they called him Amirul Mukminin. They didn't call the leaders imams. In those days, they, they said Amir, meaning leader. But at, at any rate, God says here in the Quran that he was going to make Ibrahim an imam to all of the worlds. And he pleaded. And also, imam from my offspring. In other words, Ibrahim, he was satisfied that he was going to be a leader, but what about the people that's coming after me? I know I'm not going to be here forever in the physical. He answered, but my promise, that is Allah answered, but my promise is not within the reach of the evildoers. So in other words, you can't ride on the coattail of what your fathers did or what your mothers did. You have to have some worth and some value to be recognized before God as a leader or as an obedient servant that is open to receive the blessings and the favor of this creator. Praise be to Allah. And Allah asked the question in the Quran, is there any reward for good other than good? Then which of the favors of your Lord will you deny? So just mentioning Ishmael again, he is in the vision that Ibrahim received. And we would rather say the truth of the matter is, is that it was not a vision from God. It was a dream that Ibrahim had. And if you don't believe me, the word is El-Manami. El-Manami. Coming from Naum. What is Naum? as salatu kaidman min and Naum. as sleep, right? Naum is sleep. And the Muslims say in the morning adhan, prayer is better than sleep. It's hard to convince us of that when we are sleepy. But at any rate, the story of Ibrahim was that he had a dream of sacrificing his son before God. Why? To show God and himself that I love God more than I love my son. And that's what he should do. He should love God more than he loves his son. He should love uh, 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 his own uh, uh, creator better than he love anything else that God has created. And so when he got up from the dream, he tried to bring the dream into a reality as though it was a vision that he got from God. And he told his son about it, Ismail. And Ismail said, yeah, oh, if that's what God told you to do, then I gotta be a El Halim, a forbearing person and, and let you take me out, you know? And when he was going about his business trying to do it, he was kind of convinced that that dream, you know, should be something he should carry out in reality. God said, stop. Don't do that. Don't sacrifice your son. Your son is valuable to you. Sacrifice the lamb that supposedly the Bible says was in the thicket. And he slaughtered the lamb. And Ismael and Ibrahim 
their lives continue. But some people, Muslims included, want to believe that God gave him the thought of bump off your son, man. And then when you try to do it, I already know I'm going to tell you to don't do it. No, we believe sometimes human beings have dreams and thoughts of wanting to prove to themselves or prove to God different things. And God has to check us from some of the thoughts that we may conjure up in our minds while we're asleep or when we are alive and woke. So you should know that God is not a being that will beckon you or beckon me or anyone to be a murderer unjustly. We have to murder people sometime, and God tells us to fight hard with those who fight against us, but don't be the aggressor. So you should know that in that source, 37, the first part of it tells you that he was in a dream, a manamu. The meme fata on the beginning is a place, a place, the word is literally suggested, a place of sleep. In a place of sleep, you do have what? Dreams when you are sleeping. All of us do. And we have wild dreams sometimes. Praise be to Allah. So it was not Isaac in this story. And I make that clear to you because many of the Christians and Jews want to supplant Isaac in this story. But yet the Bible itself, they didn't take it out, thank God. It says that Ibrahim was to, to sacrifice thine only son. So Ishmael was the, his first son, and he was older than Isaac by a number of years. So Isaac and Ishmael were brothers, and the Jews, or the, I should say the Hebrews, they claim Isaac as a, in that story of the sacrifice, and yet it doesn't mention any kind of conflict between Ishmael and Isaac in the Quran or the Bible. In fact, in that Surah 37, right after telling the story of uh, the sacrifice concerning Ishmael, Allah tells us in verse 113 of chapter 37, we blessed him and Isaac, but of their progeny are some that do right and some that obviously do wrong to their own souls. So praise be to Allah, he makes things clear and corrects things that came in the Bible language and in scripture before the glorious Quran. The, the Quran is called a, a tasdik, a confirmation of the truth that came before and a rebuttal or a canceling out of some of the lies and untruths and misunderstandings that have occurred in the scriptural life and the historical life of human beings. Praise be to Allah. So I take you now, I see the time is running real fast, to chapter 2, verse 148. If I'm not mistaken here, I'm going to it now. Yeah, 148. Beautiful series of verses that I love to recite and explain and get spirit and energy from. And I thank Allah that he has blessed me to understand something of this Arabic language. And if you want to understand this Arabic language, you should endeavor to do so. And it's easy to understand if you take the time. And it's not a whole lot of time that you need to put into it, actually. Once you learn the 61 word patterns, go to uh, YouTube. And I got a lecture there called Extracting Arabic Roots. And that's another story. But inshallah. We're going to be having a more of a, a regular presence in trying to explain this language to the masses. Walikuli which had ten huwa muwalli ha fastabikul karat aina ma takunul yati bikumullahu jamian in Allah ala kuli shayin kadir. To each, Abdullah Yusuf Ali says, to each is a goal. I would like to supplant the word. To each is a character. Waj is translated as gold and also is translated, translated, pardon me, as face sometimes. But in this instance, which hatun 
I'm postulating to you that it's saying, and to each is a character, a face. And you see face many times, and you see character or lack thereof. Like we were watching the tennis match, and I was telling uh, my wife uh, that these people just sitting there, they're like they're arrogant. And she said, yeah, I was talking to Nicole. She said the same thing. Praise be to Allah. God has blessed us sometimes to see the character or lack of character in people just from looking at their face without them even uttering a word. Praise be to Allah. So to each is a character to which Allah turns him or her. Then, then strive, Allah reveals, I'm translating, as in a race. And notice the Abdullah Yusweli says in, in parentheses, as in a race. Why? I know why, praise be to Allah, because festabukul is what we call the A form command. And it's saying that this is an internal race. You are striving as in a race, but the race is really internal. You are just trying to do the best you can to go as fast as you can in the way of good, regardless of the pace of the other human beings. So you should not want a race wherein when the baton is exchanged, the opponent falls down. You don't, you don't want any of that kind of stuff. You want to have a photo finish where all of us get to the end with levels of good that will cause us to be denizens and residents of the hereafter when we leave in heaven and have peaceful and successful life materially and spiritually and morally on this side as well. So that's why Abdullah Yusuf Ali says, as in a race, because he's translating the, the reflexive ta in that word, festabikul karat, praise be to Allah. So strive as in a race toward all that is good. And wheresoever you are, Allah will bring you together. For Allah has power over all things. Praise be to Allah. And as I say, I'm very appreciative of the fact that God has blessed me to meet many, many, many good Muslims around America. And we meet on one occasion, and we're friends for life. That happens. And you meet some people, they reject you and they don't want to be your friend. They hate you for your, your goodness or your achievements and your efforts. That's a part of the reality of living in the midst of human beings. So but you should know that there are many, many good people in the world and ask Allah, we ask Allah to bless us to latch on and get to know good human beings that Allah has given, given favor and blessings upon. And do not be jealous of any human being. Just get your share of the material world, and God commands you to do so. So the next ayah, 149 of chapter 2, and whensoever you start forth, Abdullah used to say, he uses the, you know, real highfalutin British English. He says, whensoever thou, we know that means you, startest forth, turn thy face, or your face, in the direction of the Masjid al-Haram, the sacred masjid. Where's the sacred masjid? The sacred masjid is near the Kaaba. The sacred masjid. It says turn your face in that direction. When you decide to go out the house, this is the, the, the suggestion. When you go out into the world, when you do anything, God is telling you and I to turn your character toward the sacred master. Why? What does the sacred master represent? The sacred master, the master al haram, represents purity of the human nature. And that's what you want to take out into the world, the best part of yourself. So again, when whoever you start for, turn your face in the direction of the sacred masjid. He's translated as mosque. We don't want to throw that French uh, 
spelling of the word. We want masjid to be a part of the English language, all right? Masjid. And masjid means a place of prostration. Sujud or sajda. Sujud is prostrations. Sajda is one prostration where you put, we put our foreheads to the floor or to the ground or to the carpet, whatever the case might be. So it's a place where you and I put our Conscious brain activity, which is right in here, before the Lord of all the worlds in a feeling in a state of submission. And God tells us that the whole earth is a masjid. And we know that the, not just the earth is a masjid, the whole universe is a masjid. And you and I should be engaged in submitting to the Lord of all the worlds so that we can be favored and have the ability to extrapolate all of the wisdom and knowledge that exists for us so we can, as God says, get utility and use out of this universe. So continuing on, that is indeed the truth from your Lord and Allah is not unmindful of what you do. So you can see clearly that God is talking about deeds, what you do and what you don't do talking about the moral conflict that you and I have daily. Star Wars, what was that? A war between good and evil. All of us deal with that in our lives. So God is telling you and I that we should turn our character toward that and remember that I have the ability to do right as opposed to doing wrong. So the next Isaiah 150 says, and so whenever you start forth, telling you and I a second time, Turn your face in the direction of the sacred masjid. Again, Abdullah Yusuf Ali says mosque, and we don't like the word mosque. I don't. And wheresoever you are, turn your face a third time. Turn your character thither, T-H-I-T-H-E-R. That means that way. What is that way? We already said it two previous times. The sacred masjid. Praise be to Allah. Masjid al-Haram. And why should you do it? Now, God is telling you and I why we should do it. That there be no grounds of hujjah, which is translated as dispute, against you. Isn't that interesting to know that hajj and hujjah come from the same letter family, if you will, or verbal or noun root, if you will. Hujja. So hujja is translated as a dispute or an argument against you. So God is telling you and I that if you put your best foot forward and you're doing the right thing, trying to do the right thing, there should be no hujja, no dispute against you. And so when you go to Hajj, when we go to Hajj, or when we reflect upon the Hajj, we know that we are going there to try to resolve the dispute that we have within our own selves in terms of us doing right or doing wrong. And they, you shave your head off, the, the hair off, the men do. I don't think we want to have any bald-headed women, <laughs> but it happens. And bald-headed women are still beautiful. But at any rate, the shaving of the hair is suggesting a new start, a new beginning, a metaphorical sense of uh, coming out of the womb of your mother again, free from impurities, undefiled, and have no sin or stain on you. And as we talked about earlier about the Hadith, that when you were in the heavenly confines of that triple darkness in the wombs of your mother, when we were there, we didn't have any sin on us. So Hajj is something that should have you cognizant of, I went there because I wanted to go on the right way. I'm cleaning myself up. So God again is telling us that you should turn your character toward that sacred master so that there'll be no hujja. Again, dealing with hajj is the same root against you. But then Allah is real and he tells us, among the people. No dispute against you among the people. I'm translating the, the translation here. Um, I should say quoting it. 
except those of them that are bent on wickedness. God is saying, no matter how much good you do, there's going to be some people that's going to be opposing you. It's going to be trying to dispute what you're trying to do if you're trying to do the right thing. So you're going to get some hujja from the wicked. We should know that and accept it. That's how God has allowed it. Then God says, so fear them not, but fear me, and that I may complete my favors on you, and you may consent, that you may consent to be guided. Praise be to Allah, the cherish and sustainer of all of the worlds. Rabbana la tuzikulubina ba'da idhadaytina wa hablana milla dunka rahma innaka anta al-wahab. Our Lord, cause not our hearts to swerve and deviate if you've guided us aright, but bestow upon us mercy from your presence, for surely you are the grandest of all of the givers. Allahumma nasta'inuka wa nasta'gfiruka wa nu'minu bika wa natawakallu alayka wa nufni alayka al-qayr wa naskuruka wa la nakfiruka. Oh Allah, we ask for your help, we ask for your forgiveness, we believe in you, we trust in you, and we extol and exalt you in the best manner, and we are thankful to you, and we are not ungrateful. Praise be to Allah. So coming to the conclusion, I'd just like to make a few more comments about our brother, Ibrahim. And Allah says in the Quran, or reveals, I don't like to say says, because God doesn't have vocal cords. He's a non-physical being, and that's hard for many people to grasp. Now you're telling me that this creation was made a physical universe, but the, the maker of it is not physical? <laughs> you're... If you study science, you believe anything about science, you know that everything that has a physical nature about it will perish. Diamonds aren't forever, as I say so often. Gold is not forever. The sun is not forever. The moon is not forever. All human beings are not forever in the physical sense. But God tells us that if we make the grade and make paradise, we will dwell there forever, living there in it forever. So physical things are perishing, but non-physical things, they do not perish. And your soul, my soul, our souls, are not succumbing to the physical reality of the physical body going into dirt. And argon gases and the helium gases, whatever gases we got in our bodies, come out into the atmosphere, even from the dirt being over the top. Praise be to Allah. So this verse says, And who can be better in religion? The word that's used is deen. And Muslims know that when we say deen, we're saying life, a way of life. Religion is a way of life. A way of life wherein morality and honor and integrity is in all aspects of our lives, whether it be business, marriage, education, government, the political arena. That's a way of life. Religion translated from deen. So God reveals women ahsanu deenam mimmen. Islam wajhahu lillahi wa huwa muksin wa tabi'a millata Ibrahima hanifan wa taqadallahu Ibrahima khalilan And who can be better in a way of life than one who submits his or her, 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 his or her whole self to Allah, does good and follows the way of Ibrahim, the true in faith. And then it says in the Abdullah Yusuf Ali translation, for Allah did take Ibrahim for a friend. He said that Ibrahim was a friend. 
This is his translation. So Muslims call Ibrahim Khalilullah. And you do not find Khalilullah in the Quran. An epithet that they have given, a title that they have given to Ibrahim. And I say to you that many times when you have Arabic words, they don't always mean the same in every verse that you might see the word appearing. So I'm saying to you, by me knowing something about the Arabic grammar, that it is not saying that Allah did take Abraham for a friend. A friend is a synonym in my mind, and perhaps in yours too, as a partner. And God has no partners. He has people that he favors, but he has no partners. So I'm saying to you that what attack of Allahu Ibrahim and Khalilan is saying, and God did know and view and see Ibrahim as what? Open, open to faith, open to desiring to submit to the creator who causes the stars to go away when morning comes. It causes the sun to go down in the nighttime. And the story in the Quran talks about Ibrahim's progression into believing in a being that has the power to cause the wax and waning of the moon and the setting of the sun and the movement of the, of the stars and all of these things. He said, I worship the one that causes all of these things to set. This is in the Quran. So he was open, wide open to faith. And you know that if you have a friend, the friend is open to you, open to your, your feelings, your problems, your business proposals, perhaps, things like that. So that's why friend and being open has some direct you know, connection there. But this is what we call a how condition. How did, ask the question of how, how did God know or perceive, or I shouldn't say perceive, how would God? How did God know Ibrahim to be? What does he be? What did he be like? You know, I'm just giving you some some uh, slang there. Ibrahim was open. So more proof or delil of what I'm saying to you. Look up the word khalla in the concordance of the Quran, in all of its uh, positions. If I'm not mistaken, it's something like 15 times where words coming from khalla, the verbal root, appears in the Quran. And I can say to you straight up here, the kala means an opening or an aperture, something that opens. And God talks about this in the verse where he says, see how I uh, open up the clouds and cause rain to come down? And metaphorically speaking, there was some confusion in Ibrahim and God opened up his understanding of, of him to the point where he knew that rain was coming down from God. That is revelation. Rain and revelation is connected in, in metaphorical understanding. So God pushed back the cause of confusion about his being to Ibrahim and caused him to know I'm a non-physical reality and I'm the one that causes the sun to wax or the moon to wax and wane and the sun to rise and set so praise be to Allah I hope that you understand that I'm saying to you that Ibrahim was a great being but to come up with the term Khalilullah they had to put this in what we call Edolfa structure connecting structure Khalilullah but God again says by attack of the Lahu and God knew Ibrahim as what Khalilan. Now notice, if I had the name Khalil as my name, it would be Khalilun, Khalilun, Khalilun. But this is a fatatain on the end of this uh, this letter for those who know something about Arabic. And this is what the, the kind of like an adverbial structure. So how, again, did God take Abraham or view Abraham? He viewed him as open. So by him knowing that he was open, he pushed back the confusion 
in his rational search and rewarded him with faith in the existence of his being, as being the power broker, if you will, in the universe. There's much more that we could say, but we thank Allah for Ibrahim because Muhammad tells us too that he followed the way or the middle of Ibrahim. So Ibrahim is viewed as our father, meaning our leader, really. But he's our father, too, in the sense that we come from the loins of Ibrahim and the womb, if you will, of Hagar, the African-Egyptian woman. And she is highly acknowledged and is very much being a being, uh, is a being that is, a, is, 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 is very, she's very aware that, the, I should say, the pilgrims are very aware of her because the Hajj itself starts going around the Kaaba and Hagar's skirt, they call it, Hagar's skirt. And so we know that Hagar and her son Ishmael was there in Mecca and water came from between the feet of Ishmael, her son, and we still have the well that the water came from, and it's called the Zamzam, the well of Zamzam, and it's still there today, and the pilgrims and the people of Mecca, they drink that water, and it's, it's an ocean of water under the sands and whatnot of Mecca. So praise be to Allah, we have the connections that we need to know that Ibrahim is our brother, Muhammad is our African Arab brother, and there's one humanity. That's another sign of the Hajj. The Hajj is letting you know that you are a part of one human family, and you should be in unity with one another. But God knows that we will destroy the unity. In fact, I'll conclude with 2192 of the Quran here, and pardon me for being a bit long-winded uh, this afternoon here on July 8th, 2192, and we'll conclude and make the uh, two sections of prayer that Allah has told us to do from the chapter 62. It says, and when the time for Juma comes forth, that's our rush to remember for your Lord. And after the prayer is finished, remember him Kathiran, that is much. So remember Allah even more so when you come up out of this Jumu'ah prayer that you make. Because we know there's a lot of wickedness out in the world and Allah has allowed it, but Allah is not a bringer of wickedness. He simply allows it. So anytime someone comes to you or come to us with wickedness and falsehoods and myths and tell you they were from God, you should reject it. So it says here, Inna hazihi umatukum ummatau wahidatan wa ana rabbukum fa'abuduni. Surely, surely this is a community. Why Abdullah Yusuf Ali says brotherhood? I don't know. Is it male chauvinism or what? I don't know. But umatukum is surely this, you all's community is a one community, Wahidatan, one community. So God is telling you and I, when you understand the grammatical structure of this, that you are one community, three successive words, Allah is telling you and I, and we are one community. We don't get it yet. But Allah is letting you know that this is the reality that should be. And I am your Rob. I am you all's Rob. So as a consequence of me being your cherisher, sustainer, and nurture, so worship me, so serve me, and no other. Abdullah Jusali puts in the parentheses, which is a good thing that was added. You know, Allah speaks of the reality, but later generations cut off their affairs of unity, one from another, yet were they all return to us. So Muslims and people of faith, I tell you, just continue to be right in spite of the wickedness around you and use every strategy that you can to 
do what you know to do and do what you know to be right and do what you can to try to influence those to come away from the wrongdoing. Rabana Afrik Alayna Sabran Batabidak Damana Wasuna Allah Kaumil Our Lord pour down upon us patience and constancy and help us against the rejection of faith within ourselves and outside of ourselves. I mean, and now I do what is known as the ikama, which is the preparation for the prayer and the commanding voice. We say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an Muhammadan Rasulullah, Hayya la salah, Hayya la al-falah, Qad qamit al-salah, Qad qamit al-salah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Malik Yawm Al-Din, Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in, Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqim, Sirata al-ladhina na'amta alayhim Ghayril maghdubi alayhim Wala'anda al-lim Ameen Allahu Akbar Subhanallah Kul huwa Allahu ahad Allahu samad Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad Allahu Akbar Sami Allahu liman hamida Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ar Rahmanir Rahim Malik Yawm Al-Din Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqim Sirat Al-Ladhina Na'amta Alayhim Ghayril Maghdubi Alayhim Wal-Anda Kul a'udhu bi rabbin nas, malikin nas, ilahin nas, min shari waswasil khan nas, alladhi yuwaswisu fi sudurin nas, min al jinnati wal nas, Allahu Akbar. Sami Allahu liman hamidahu Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله May Allah accept our salah, that is, Rabbana wa taqabbal dua, may Allah accept our call to him. Here I have my book called Nukutut Tanzil, The Language of Revelation. And I encourage you strongly to secure the book. And this book is structured in such a way where I'm trying to make it plain for the masses to be able to pick up the Quran and understand it for themselves. You don't want any middle men or middle women. And this book is designed to cause you to be able to do tafsir, explanation of the Quran, and understand it and have the dalil to back up the light that Allah will bless you with if you become a serious student of the glorious Quran and be a word tracker in the uh, Quran. In fact, there's a saying that the best explanation of the Quran is the Quran itself. If you believe that, as I believe it, you will be able to get light and drive and inspiration from this Quran directly from the Arabic words that Allah revealed to our African our Prophet Muhammad over 1400 years ago. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So to secure the book, email me. Easy email to remember, Sadiq, S-I-D-D-E-Q at M-S-N dot com. Sadiq, S-I-D-D-E-E-Q at M-S-N dot com. Or you can go right to the internet and go to SadiqJihad dot com. That's S-I-D-D-E-Q, Jihad is spelled J-I-H-A-D dot com. So I thank you for listening, and I pray a lot that I did give some insight, and you will be benefited by the khutbah that I delivered today, the sermon that I delivered today. So I say to you, from the best part of myself, from the core of my heart, I didn't say the bottom of my heart, but that's almost out of the heart. In the Arabic idiom, they say, the core of the heart. I love you from the core of my heart. I love all good human beings from the core of my heart, not the bottom. Praise be to Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuhu wa jannatuhu. That is, the peace of God be upon you and his mercy and his blessings and his paradise. Enjoy the rest of this day and may you have a Jumu'a Mubarakah. And notice I said Jumu'a Mubarakah. It's incorrect grammatically for you to say Jumu'a Mubarak. So you should say Jumu'a Mubarakah. And I've been telling people on Facebook this over and over again each week. And I only know of two people that now say, or write as I write, Jumu'a Mubarakah. Put that A on the end makes it a feminine word, Mubarakah. And Jumua, it also, that H is denoting femininity. So the word Jumua is a, is a feminine word, if you will, because all nouns are either masculine or feminine. And Mubaraka has to be in agreement and have femininity as well. So there's a feminine T on Mubaraka ton, and there's a feminine T on Jumua ton. So if you want to do it right, you should say Jumua. Mubarakah. This is a new thing that's come up amongst the Muslims. It wasn't around when Imam Warafti Muhammad was around and the origin of it, I know not of it. But it's okay to say, and it's grammatically correct to say, Ramadan Mubarak. That's, that's great because Ramadan is a masculine noun. So Mubarak is a masculine adjective. The adjective must be masculine if the noun is masculine. If the noun is feminine, the adjective noun that's describing it, it too must be feminine. So I pray Allah that you will take that to heart 
And if you don't believe me, ask in a, a grammarian or get a, grammar, a grammar book or my book, and you'll see that that's a true statement coming from your brother Sadiq, which means a truthful tongue anyway. Praise be to Allah. And one other thing I want to say to you, it hurts me to hear the Muslims say, Alhamdulillah, because they want to say Allah. But really, if you want to say, say it, which is customarily said in recitation of the Quran or just in common speech, Muslims say, or Arabs say, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. So please correct yourself and say Alhamdulillah as opposed to Alhamdulillah. And I always like to say also that Allah is not a ham. So I don't like to say Alhamdu, or we shouldn't say it. It's Alham, a little air come out with that H. Alhamdulillah, some effort is made. Don't have a lazy tongue. Alhamdulillah. And then we say, Bismillah. We don't say Bismillah. We say Bismillah. And another reason why we say, say it in a flat way, it's called Tarqiq, is because whenever a Kasra, an E sound, comes before Allah, we flatten the sound to La. So that's why you heard me say, Alhamdulillah. There's a Li in front of Allah there. So I say, Alhamdulillah. And then we got Bismi. There's an E on the M, on the mean before Allah. So we say, Bismillah. We flatten out the sound of Allah. So I hope that you take that to heart and you follow me, your brother, in following the way that it should be uttered. So again, I say to you, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuhu. And I add, La yazalullahu muksinan. Ilaykum. That is, may Allah never stop being uh, an excellent doer to you all.